Okay, it's 4 p.m. Uh, we're going to kick off our webinar today, How Did They Get That Shot? American Bird Conservancy's second webinar in our series on bird photography. Thank you for joining and welcome. Um, for those of you who joined early, thanks for your patience. Um, we appreciate that. I'm Mike Parr, I'm President of American Bird Conservancy. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, the first webinar we did a little while ago, we will send a link to you in the next little while. And you may be interested in that one as well. It was recorded and actually goes into a little bit more on things like gear and settings for bird photography. Today we'll be talking about more specifics about getting the shots in the field. Um, so you'll get that link in the email. Um, I want to thank quickly my co-presenters today, who I'll be giving a more formal introduction to in a minute, and to the ABC staff who've helped to set this up, particularly Claire Nielsen, Erica Sanchez, Darius Zubkowski, and um, Jordan Rutter, who've really helped us put this together. Thank you to them. You've done a wonderful job, and we really appreciate it. Um, just want to tell you very quickly about American Bird Conservancy for those who don't know. Uh, we're a nonprofit conservation organization. We work to prevent bird extinctions, to turn around the widespread bird declines that you've probably read about from the science paper last year, but these have unfortunately been going on for some time um, through habitat conservation. And we do that work across the Americas uh, and building the capacity to deliver bird conservation, both through the science and the community of support that we need to have in order to deliver the work we do and our partners. Um, if you're not already a member of ABC, I would uh, invite you to join. Um, it starts at $20 per year. And for that, you'll get our magazine and be able to support bird conservation. Our website is abcbirds.org, which you can see there on the screen alongside the golden winged warbler, which is one of the species that we focus on in the United States. Um, so thank you again for joining. Those of you who are already members, we appreciate it. Those of you who are not, we'd love it if you'd consider joining. Um, and I just wanna tell you just what to expect today. We're gonna to try and keep this about 40, 45 minutes of presentations, and then we'll have room for questions and answers, uh, which Jordan will moderate. Participants will be on mute because we found in the past that we get some audio feedback if we open it up and it'll be a, a smoother webinar for everybody. So do, just use the chat for any comments or questions you'd like to make. Um, you may wanna grab a pen and a bit of paper or have your smartphone ready. Um, during the presentation, some of the slides of the images that the photographers are showing will show the actual camera settings that people use to get those pictures. And if you're interested in uh, the specific settings, aperture, ISO, um, exposure time, things of that nature, you can jot those down or, or photograph them, although we will send it to you after the fact. Um, also want to just briefly tell you, um, last year, American Bird Conservancy published a book with Owen Deutsch, and it's called Bringing Back the Birds. And there's a photograph from the book that Owen took in Peru. Uh, we were there on that trip of the marvelous spatula tail, one of my favorite birds. A lot, it's along with at least 200 other pictures in the book. Uh, you can actually get that as when you join ABC or buy it online. It supports ABC, and it's got great uh, photography from Owen Deutsch in it, and is a terrific publication if you're interested in that. Um, so uh, I will move on to the next slide, but before we get started, I just want to remind everybody in bird photography, please always put the bird's welfare first. Uh, don't get close to nests. And if you feel like you're disturbing the bird, it's a good time to think about stopping and backing away and let, letting the bird have some space so that they can go about feeding or tending to their young or other things that they're doing. So with that, um, I will introduce again more formally our featured photographers today. Uh, Owen Deutsch is a former fashion photographer. He's become a passionate bird photographer and provided all the photos for the, the great book. Owen's gonna tell you a little bit more about his own background in a minute. Um, Owen joined us for the first webinar we did. Uh, Laura Keane is um, joining us for the first time today. She's a pharmacist by profession, um, but she's an avid birder and photographer. Uh, and she broke the ABA big year record in 2016 for photography, uh, photographing 792 species, which to me is almost unbelievable. It's an amazing accomplishment. I've done a lot of birding. I've never got past just seeing 500. So that's uh, mind boggling to me, a wonderful accomplishment. Grace Galzo is a dedicated conservationist and her images have been recognized and published by the North American Nature Photography Association and Nature's Best Magazine. Grace has been with us on 
previous webinars and will be showing some wonderful photographs, particularly of birds on the beach. Michael Stubblefield is a naturalist, a scientist, and a physician whose photography combines artistic, journalistic, and technical skill, enhanced by Michael's keen observation and his travels around the world. And Michael also has joined us uh, on past webinars. And last but by no means least, and my good friend Shoaib Tureen, who is a founder of the Anthro Corporation and co-founder of the Tureen Filgus Foundation. Um, Shoaib is a member of the American Bird Conservancy Board of Directors, and he and I, um, I've spent quite a bit of time out birding and photographing birds together, also with Owen. And uh, it's great that Shoaib's able to join us today. It's going to show some great pictures from Alaska in particular. So that's our, our lineup for today. And Jordan, of course, will be moderating. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm now going to turn it over to our first panelist, Owen Deutsch. Um, and again, I think I saw a question, uh, who am I? I'm the president of American Bird Conservancy. I will be showing you some pictures later. But to start with, I am delighted to turn it over to my good friend and collaborator, Owen Deutsch. Owen, it's all you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the introduction. I have been passionate about photography all my life. Professionally, my first career was as a fashion photographer, which I retired from after 20 years. I spent the following 20 years developing real estate. Then I retired from real estate and went back into photography. But this time, the beauty was all about the birds. I have never been much of a tech geek. I've always tried to keep things simple. It has always been about the beauty, whatever the subject. So it's no surprise that for the last four or five years, I've basically used the same equipment and not varied my technique very much. The Nikon D850 and the 500 millimeter 5.6 lens is the combination that works fabulously for me. With close to 50 megapixels, the resolution is amazing. And because of that high resolution, I must be careful of the noise. I set the high ISO limit to not exceed 2500. I also have a D5 that is my backup camera and I will on occasion use if I have much, have a higher ISO, you need a higher ISO. As you will see in the following pictures, my goal is to have a depth of field as shallow as possible. To accomplish this, I only stop my lens down maybe one half to one stop at the most. That is one half to one stop from wide open because at wide open, everything's blurry. You don't get any depth of field and so I stop down just a smidgen. In camera settings, everything is a compromise towards achieving your goal. With shutter speed, in most cases, I'm trying to stop the action. The compromise here is ISO. The lower the ISO, generally speaking, the better the resolution. The answer to these questions is trial and error, experience and repetition. This white-necked Jacobin did, oops, got that's the Baltimore Oriole. I'm sorry, I was supposed to start with that, forgive me. But this white-necked Jacobin, uh, what I just described is about how I shoot the, um, my uh, f-stop as being wide open. It'll make the background and foreground blur quite a bit, thus making your birds stand out with the pleasing blurs, blurs and often with gorgeous blended colors as in these photo, photograph, photos. If you could go back to the, um, uh, the Oriole, I'll show you what I meant by, there we go, thank you. That was done with, uh, first of all, I move around because I'm hand holding the camera. And that this is one of my favorite pictures. I shot this in Belize uh, just in January. Um, anyway, I love the background. If you took the bird out of the picture, I'd love the picture just almost as much. Anyway, if you could move on to what was the next one, the white neck Jacobin, uh, or nope, that was the trap. Look at the background in this picture. Um, I move around a little bit because if the bird was over to the left, maybe it would not work as well. But the backgrounds are one of the most important things for my pictures. Um, anyway, the, now to the white neck Jacobin, if you could. Great. This is a little different. This is just soft, muted, blurry colors. There's background back there, but it's almost wide open with a 500 millimeter lens. It just blows the background out and the bird really stands out. 
This is why I spend so much time to make the background so attractive since I'm hand holding a relatively light camera and I can move around easily and often position the bird so the background is perfectly located in the photograph. The following uh, are a few more options. You see how the Rufus uh, Hummingbird sat there for a long time and I moved around and put the background just where I wanted, wanted it. Anyway, um, it is true you usually don't have much time to adjust your composition by moving around, but after you get a few good shots, you should keep shooting and work to improve it. The Violet Saberwing and the Rufus Tail Hummingbird was at a feeder, and as I'm sure you know, it feeds for a second, then pulls back and repeats again and again. I adjusted my position so that just the right amount of highlight could be seen in the background and, find, and line the bird up so the background was very dark and the bird would glow. The Rufus Tail Hummingbird made it a little easier for me since it was sitting on this wire just long enough so I could position this hot glowing background just where I wanted it. The same for the olive-backed euphonia. This laughing falcon, next picture please. Thank you. Uh, falcon, another challenge. That black and white head was often in a poor position to get separation from the background. About as close as I could get to him was maybe 150 feet. And when I positioned him as I did in this photo, I got just the separation I was hoping for. For this hooded warbler, next picture please, and white-winged Picard, I managed to move into a position where it felt like the bird was in a secluded cave-like area. It just was a nice feeling for me in both of the pictures. You don't always have that much time, but just be patient. One of my favorite things to do is to create a background, if I can, that is a work of art on its own. By hand-holding the camera, this becomes much easier to accomplish. The following two snail kite photos, next, there we go, thank you, are interesting and engaging because there's some body movement where the one bird is about to take off and the other one is about to enjoy a gourmet meal of snails. I love that snail. These two golden-fronted woodpecker photos, thank you, I find very uh, pleasing and engaging because I like body movement, heads turning in the atmosphere of the beautiful clean backgrounds. This, oh, the next photo, please. This photo of the lesser yellow-headed vulture, I find very regal because he appears to be sitting on a throne with a head turn that gives it a wonderful attitude. The entire environment I find captivating. This gartered trogon had presented itself with a perfect profile, enabling me to capture it in perfect sharpness with all the detail I could hope for in one photograph. However, when I first started shooting this trogon, he was sitting on a different branch that wasn't anywhere as nice as this one. I kept trying to improve my position and angle. Then after 20 minutes or so, he moved to this branch and I got my shot. You just have to be patient and not give up and often you'll be rewarded. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Laura Keene. Thank you. Laura. Hello, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Owen. Um, I was turned on to birding in high school. I took a summer field biology class, had a wonderful teacher who pointed out belted kingfisher and bank swallows on the canoe trips. And then I saw my spark bird, which was an indigo bunting. So I bought my first Peterson's field guide with babysitting money. And, you know, things got busy and college and um, you know, I was working as a pharmacist and I had a family, but I managed to take some photography classes. And those two passions just ended up merging pretty quickly. And living in Ohio, I had the opportunity to visit McGee Marsh every year. So I got totally hooked on warblers. I was the photo editor for the Ohio Cardinal, which is a publication of the Ohio Ornithological Society until 2016 when I took a year off and I did a big year. 
Well, currently I live in Texas, still working as a pharmacist, and I'm on the ABA Recording Standards and Ethics Committee. Next slide. Like everyone else during the pandemic, I've been spending a lot of time at home, and my birding and photography has been kind of limited to the local areas. But working from home has given me the opportunity to focus on some birds in my backyard, and I've got some cool ones. We just moved to Texas from Ohio a couple of years ago, so I'm still learning about the birds in my backyard. And I learn something new every day as I observe the birds and the wildlife. I put together a small fountain and I prop up sticks around it for perches. And I set my camera up on the porch to take photos. The black cat vireo were listed as an endangered species in 1987, nearly extinct with a population of only 350 individuals. Well, thanks to conservation efforts, the population is now over 14,000. They're the smallest vireo in the US and very fast. To photograph birds, it's really important to spend time observing their behavior and learning their habits so you can be prepared for that great shot. These vireos would always come for baths in the afternoon, so I had to wait for the perfect day with light clouds providing good light to have my camera set up on the porch. But they're still not easy. Their bath consists of several frantic dips in the water, followed by preening in the tree, which is not a great opportunity for photos, but sometimes they would hop down to the rock or the perch before taking a dip. That was the behavior I was targeting. It took a lot of time, but I finally got the shot I was looking for with this female. Next slide. More plentiful in my backyard are the painted buntings arguably the most stunning bird in the US. Again, it is best to observe and learn the bird's habits. They love to take daily baths, so I have plenty of photo ops. But I've learned over the past two years that my best opportunities for a photo are in early spring, when the birds have newly arrived. Once other males arrive, they become extremely territorial, constantly on guard, and their baths are frequently interrupted with chases and drama. And they're more likely to be at the bath during the early hours and before sunset, which does work well for lighting. Next slide. Well, photography at your home gives you the best type of control. After all, these birds are there every day. So once you learn their habits, you can choose the best days with the best lighting to devote to photography. Once you leave your home for vacations or birding trips, you often have less than perfect circumstances for photography. You have to work around the weather and the lighting conditions and adjust your strategy for the best shot. Within 90 minutes of my house is a large bat cave in Concan, Texas. And each evening around sunset, 10 to 12 million bats depart the cave. It's the second largest bat flight in the world available to the public. So when friends and family come to visit us in Texas, it's a must see. I realized my first visit that the amazing bat flight also attracted a lot of raptors. They waited for the evening exodus, then they would position themselves to fly into the stream and try and catch a bat. So each trip, I would observe the behavior of that hawks and try to predict the right place to stand to capture the hawk activity. Next slide. The bats fly at an unpredictable time each evening, so the lighting can be bad to worse. The wind conditions affect the direction that they fly, so gusts can change the direction constantly. So it's a challenge in many ways, and with the variance in lighting in almost any direction, I decided to focus on shooting the hawk above the horizon for higher speed. Every few minutes, you're adjusting as you lose light. I always use aperture priority for action shots, so I only need to adjust one setting to maintain a fast enough speed. On this day, the bats flew a little earlier than previous visits. You can see from the pink coloration from the sunset on the hawk. I use my 100-400 lens handheld for more versatility. It took eight visits to finally get this shot, and I was very happy to finally be successful in capturing the actual moment of the grab. Next slide. Another lighting challenge can be after sunset, as in the case of this great horned owl. Well, any experience with an owl is special. We were staying in Arizona and been woken up by a pair of owls calling during the first night. Well, each night, starting at sunset, we retreated to the pair hunting gophers around our rental. Well, I would have been just as happy to watch them, and I realized I would have very little luck in the low light, but I still set up my camera and tripod on the porch and had lots of opportunities to experiment with the settings. 
On this evening, they were out a little bit earlier, so I had a little bit of light. The white on the owl was blown out on my first images, so I decreased the exposure compensation by one third, then two thirds, then down to minus one. When the owl landed on the closest fence post, it was nearly dark and the green trees in the background were a nice contrast. As you can see, I really pushed this one by using only one 250th of a second, but owls actually tend to hold themselves very still. She was watching the male in the tree behind me above the house, and somehow this all worked. In Photoshop and levels, I only needed to slightly brighten the whites and then slightly darken the lower tones, and the green turned to black without affecting the color of the bird. It took a couple of evenings of experimenting, but what an experience to watch these owls interacting with each other and hunting and getting an image I love was icing on the cake. Next slide. Another challenge is unexpected weather. This is a Bicknell's thrush in fog. It's the rarest and most secretive species of thrush in North America. It looks almost identical to a gray cheek thrush. I really wouldn't be able to tell them apart. But fortunately, they, just, they prefer different habitat at higher altitudes at over 3,000 feet and have a distinctly different song. If you're motivated to see this bird, like if you were doing a big year, you hope to get to the right area early morning so you can hear them sing. And for me, hopefully get an image. Mount Washington in New Hampshire has an auto tour, a 30 minute drive to the top of the highest peak in Northeastern US, which incidentally held the record for the highest recorded wind speed for many years. I should have expected the weather might be an issue. They also didn't open until eight o'clock which was two and a half hours after sunrise. So I was a little worried they would have stopped singing by then. As I drove up the mountain, I suddenly entered a wet cloud of fog and could barely even see the road in front of me. This was gonna be a challenge that I didn't expect. They nest in areas just below the tree line, which I couldn't see. So once I was over 3000 feet in, in elevation, I just pulled over at each pull off and listened for their song. I finally heard one in the distance and saw some movement on the ground. For the next few minutes, I photographed the thrush out my car window through the wet cloud, doubting I would get an identifiable photo, but it was the right bird because it would occasionally hop up to a perch and sing. You can see the image I got. I was really shocked that my camera was able to see it better than my eye, so I was thrilled to get an identifiable image. Next slide. But when I opened it in Photoshop, it only took one quick slide of the level to totally erase the fog. With only one adjustment, I was amazed that a bird that I could barely see through the fog had turned out so clear. I would highly recommend taking a course in post-processing images or just watch some of the many videos on, available online to learn new techniques. So that concludes my slides. And now I'll turn it over to Michael. Right. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I can hear you. Great, thank you. I'm um, seeing a lot of technical questions coming into the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we can answer those questions and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Um, so keep the questions coming and we'll try and tackle as many of them as we can. Um, but certainly there's a lot of great questions in there about settings, uh, about different modes, about shutter speeds and things of that nature, teleconvertive blurriness. We will get to as many of those as we can, but I think we can certainly help with those. So um, I'm Mike Parr, president of ABC. I have been photographing birds for a very long time, um, but not very well for most of that time. And only in the last couple of years, with the help of people like Owen and others, have I really started to get to a point where I'm more happy with my picks. So let's, uh, let's start off with the picks I wanted to show you. I didn't really want to tell you kind of three stories um, about photographs that I've taken in some of my favorite places to photograph birds that you might enjoy too. Um, so this picture is from one of my very favorite places to go and photograph birds, which is the beach at Moss Landing in California. And it's a wonderful place to photograph birds of all types. Um, the marsh behind the beach is great, but particularly I love to go on the beach there in the morning, first thing, and photograph the godwits and curlews that gather on the beach, and there's him and skulls and other birds that gather there too. But I just want to tell you a little bit about my favorite there, which is long-billed curlews. Um, 
This was very early in the morning when the light wasn't particularly good. And as you can see from my settings, I was on pretty high ISO. This is with a Canon 1DX Mark II, which is a, a full frame uh, sensor. And so it can handle fairly high ISO pretty well. It's not too noisy, um, but you need that to be able to get the speed that you need um, to get a shot like this with a bird moving. So you can see it's still at a thousandth of a second. Um, that's with a 600 millimeter Sigma that I use. It's a 150 to 600 zoom, but most of the time I'm at 600. And while it's the picture's fine, it's not really my favorite picture. It's a little bit dull and flat. So maybe we can move on to the next picture. This one I actually like a little better, even though it's not flying. Um, it feels, I like the background as Owen pointed out. And I think one thing I've learned from Owen more than anything is look at the background, not just the bird. Because I spend all my time trying to photograph the bird, but the photograph is still usually only about 20%, 15, 20% bird and 80, 85% background. So I think I like these blurred backgrounds because it really picks out the bird. Uh, and this one again at 4,000 uh, ISO, a little slower, but I was able to get down low and use the sand to kind of brace myself. And so it's pretty sharp, but it's still a little bit flat. So move on to the next image, if you don't mind. So this is what happens at Moss Landing when the sun crests the dune, which is right behind you, because it's, ri it's uh, rising in the east and you're looking west out to the Pacific on the beach there. And the second that the sun comes up above the dune behind you, it illuminates the birds uh, in a way that just makes them glow. It's what they call the golden hour. And it happens around about 8 a.m. usually on that moss landing beach. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the speed went right up to one four, one four thousandth of a second. And I was able to bump up to F8 as well. And still, um, I'm getting a super fast shutter speed with a little bit more depth there. So stopping down a little bit, um, get a little bit more depth, but still have a nice blurry background. But still, the photo is a little bit static, and I thought I could do a bit better. Now, one thing to know about Moss Landing Beach is, uh, as I said earlier, always put the bird first. If you're very quiet and you sit in the sand and you sort of shuffle along on your backside or roll around or use your elbows to move around, the birds will actually come to you. You don't need to chase birds around on the beach. Just get yourself in the right place and they'll just keep feeding and they'll let you get close that way. They'll come to you and that's often a much better way to do it. Um, next photograph, please. So this was the, the picture I liked the most. And what often happens is that the curlews go into the water and they get surprised by a larger wave and they, they fly back up a little bit into the shallower water. And so I managed to get this, as you can see, I've stopped down on the ISO now, but I'm still at 1 3200 of a second at F8. The F8 was enough to get the depth of field I needed. Even though there's a little bit of movement in the wingtips, the water is fairly nicely frozen but the rest of the bird is well illuminated and sharp. And I, I like this, this picture because of the movements and action in it. Um, but those are my tips for Moss Landing and getting a shot like this is make sure you're there at the right place and the right time. Uh, allow the birds to come to you and wait for the light. Um, and you can get really great shots of long bill curlews at Moss Landing. Next, please. So this is another great place I love to photograph birds is in Australia. Um, this is a male satin bowerbird photographed at Lamington National Park at O'Reilly's, which is the place where a lot of people stay. Uh, it's a little bit dark in parts, but I still love the eye. Uh, satin bowerbirds have got these beautiful violet eyes, both the males and females, and they've got real um, texture to the eyes if you get up close. They're really tremendously amazing looking birds. Um, and we've got nice blurry background. It's sharp and I like the picture, but it's a little static, and again, not a whole lot going on. So next slide, please. So what I discovered about satin bowerbirds, which you may already know, is that the males love blue items that they will put in their bower to attract the female. And this might give you the impression that uh, Lamington National Park is full of trash, which it's really not. These are probably bottle tops and pens that those bowerbirds have picked up over a very long period of time. And they used to uh, display to the females um, if you find these, you know that you're at a bower. So again, place and time is super important. When you find a bower, you're able to set up and uh, watch the bird behaving in its bower. So next slide, please. 
So I was able to do that and get to a point where I wasn't disturbing the bower bird and get a good angle on the bower. But of course, the problem here is all the sticks and leaves in the way, which people who like Grace know the, the uh, biggest week in, in uh, American birding know that twigs often get in the way of warblers. Well, in this case, they were getting in the, in the way of the bower bird. And so this picture, although it was interesting, wasn't really what I'd looked for. Next slide, please. But I finally got this picture and while it's dark, I love the way that the, the shaft of light picks out the bowerbird's face and eye. And I just love those bowerbird eyes. And this picture has a story because even though you've got the blue items in the foreground, because there's shallow depth of field, as you can see, it's at F5, um, it didn't really enable you to see all of the bottle tops and pens too much. And some of those are rosella feathers. But the interesting part of this is the bowerbird's hate having yellow stuff in their bowers. And this bower bird is picking up a yellow leaf from its bower to clean it out and get rid of it and just leave the blue items. So this picture also had a bit of a story to it. And that's why I like this particular picture because of the, I was in the right place, right time planning, and also a little bit of luck goes with it to get that moment of the yellow leaf. Next, please. So I've got another story about fog, and I would just say that you can make bad weather your friend at times. This is actually, again, uh, in California at Big Sur, and it was a day when I was driving along to, to photograph California condors, and I realized it was really foggy, and that's looking down the cliff from the top of the cliff. Um, I was worried about it on the one hand, but I thought if I got the right shot, I might have fog in the background to really pick out the condor if I was really lucky. So. Um, the condors tend to come down on Big Sur near to the A-frame on Route 1 there around 10 a.m. and then they leave to go back up slope around 1 p.m. after feeding on the seals on the beach. And it's a great time to go and photograph them. Around 1 o'clock is better because they spend some time gliding around on the cliffs. So next slide, please. Now looking up from there, you've got nice blue sunlight, but unfortunately the condor, as you can see from this picture, was way too far away. Um, so I had two problems. One was weathered looking down and the other one was distant contours looking up. Next slide, please. But eventually the contours started moving around below me. And this was the effect that I was trying to go for using the 600 millimeter again, uh, relatively low ISO because it was quite bright. F6.3, I got to one sixteen hundredth of a second. But the fog and some movement was kind of blurring the contour a little bit. Still wasn't quite perfect, but you can see the effect of the fog blurring the background makes it almost look like an illustration. Next slide, please. So condors started going back the other way, similar effect, but still a little blurry and not really what I was looking for. Next slide, please. Finally, the condor came right past me, but unfortunately I made my usual mistake of zooming in too much. And so I cut, cut off a big portion of the wing of the condor. And right about this time I was joined by another gentleman who was um, radio tracking this condor and he climbed halfway down the cliff uh, to get photographs and it looked awfully perilous to me so I stayed up on top and there's a little wall there you can stand behind which is uh, for those who get vertigo like me sometimes looking over the edge of cliffs is a safer place to stand. Next slide please. But fortunately um, in that sequence I was able to get one shot uh, where the bird was about right and it was a question of luck, but it was about to land and I had nice fog behind. So the fog worked for me and the plan came together pretty well. Next slide, please. And then finally, the condors started to soar around above me and to the side and I was able to get a, a, a pretty good shot here. Still not exactly what I want. Uh, I'd love to go back there, but I would say that planning, um, my, my main story for today is that place and time is critical and planning and understanding what the bird is gonna do will, will uh, set you in really great stead to get good photographs. But at the same time, always keep an eye on your settings. Think about when you're looking up, uh, you may need to correct for exposure. Um, try and keep the ISO down, um, but make sure your speed's good. And I usually shoot in AV mode, so I'm not really looking at uh, changing my speed. I'm just looking at keeping my aperture where I want it. So that's what I wanted to share for today. And uh, top headline is planning, getting the right place in time will get you some great picks. And that's how I got those picks. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Grace.
Thank you very much, Grace. Thank you kindly, Mike. I appreciate the warm introduction. I'd just like to give a very quick shout out to ABC for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And also a mention to the folks who are behind the scenes. What you see is us sharing our nice photos and talking a little bit to you about, what, about our passion, but there's a lot going on that you don't see. So thanks to them. Um, I came to nature photography for one reason. That is two reasons, actually. I love being outdoors in nature and I love drawing and painting. However, I cannot even draw a stick figure. So by combining photography with my passion for the outdoors, hopefully I'm able to create some uh, artful photos. Whether or not I succeed in that, I guess is actually up to you, but I keep trying to do that instead of just a series of endless clicks. Uh, next, please. I was very fortunate to live most of my adult life on the North Shore of Long Island. There was a beautiful beach there called West Meadow Beach. And in the evening, you got just gorgeous light. And when the tide went out, there were these beautiful flats that formed. Um, and it was home to oftentimes as many as four to six pairs of nesting piping plovers. So you can imagine a middle-aged woman lying flat on the sand with a big lens um, in waders covered in mud would attract a fair amount of attention. So it was not unusual for people to come over and ask me what I was doing. So one evening I was, I was in that position and a little girl, probably around eight, and her mom came over and they asked what I was uh, photographing. And I pointed out these little plovers that were running around. And the girl gave such an honest reaction. She said, I didn't know that birds lived on the ground. I thought they only lived in trees. Now that's actually fairly fascinating. You know, certain things we just assume that everybody knows, but they don't. How would they? So on my way home that night, I started thinking about the many evenings that I had spent up at West Meadow and realized that through years of doing this, I had, cre I had actually captured the entire life cycle of these birds from the time they arrived mid-March through the time they leave to go back to the Bahamas for the winter. So I came home and decided to write a children's story about these little birds. And during my storyboarding exercises, I discovered that there were a few behaviors that needed to be included in the, in the story that I had not yet captured. So with that in mind, I pre-visualized the photo that I wanted and set out to get it. Um, this, this was one of them. Um, as these little birds uh, start to run around the beach, pretty soon after they're born, they start exercising their wings. It's important for them to, to do that so they can eventually fly. Now, as far as our settings go, what was important in this case was shutter speed, because you want to have enough shutter speed to freeze those little wings and not create a blur. I was shooting with my Canon uh, 600 F4 and a two times teleconverter, so I was a 12 100 millimeters, and my f-stop could not be more wide open than f8. So I had to default to an ISO of 1600 in order to, to get that shutter speed that I needed. Um, those, that's the technical considerations for this pre-visualized image. Uh, next slide, please. So sometimes images just fall into your lap and you end up creating something that you really had no intention of. Um, Ted and I moved down to Texas in uh, the spring of 2018. I wasn't that familiar with really what was around here on our little piece of land. So one evening I packed my uh, tripod and my 600 and my camera and teleconverters and whatever else and hiked up the lane and was trying to see what was around. I heard something going on in the brush. It sounded like cardinals and the brush was too thick for me to hike in with my, my lens. So I just parked everything on the lane and, and walked in. And almost immediately, the cardinals began alarming. And my interpretation was that I had somehow invaded, intruded on a nest or something like that. So I said, okay, let me get out of here. So I turned to walk out. And you know how when you're in the field, sometimes you just catch a flash of something going by. I saw this big, heavy bodied bird flying out of there and down our lane. So I got on my cell phone and I called Ted and I said, hey, some big bird just flew down toward the house. Do you mind heading out to the front porch? take a peek around and see if you see anything. So I walked back with my stuff and he was on the front porch and he said, yeah, the bird's sitting over there on the edge of the field. Couldn't quite tell what it was. So I walked over to the, the far edge 
plunk my tripod down with the thought of just looking through the lens to see what it was. And sure enough, the bird took off and flew right toward me. Like how often does that really happen? Um, it landed in the field and it grabbed something, something which I believe was a snake or a big worm or something and ate it. Couldn't tell what it was because that, ac that action took place down in the grasses. Um, but I was um, really quite intrigued when the bird finished his meal and then decided to look at me with his horns perfectly flat, almost as if to say, hey, uh, what are you looking at? Now, I would just like to talk quickly about the settings that I employed for this photo. Unlike Owen, I cannot handhold my gear. Um, in bright light, for a very short amount of time, yes. But this actually took place after dark. So I needed to be on a tripod, not after dark, after sunset, it was dusk. So I needed to be on a tripod because I was at ISO of 1600, wide open, and I could only get one 1 25th of a second. So I would never have been able to handhold that. And even so, I had to use good long lens technique in order to keep everything still and get this bird sharp in the frame. Um, it's about a 50% crop, um, which I'm fine with. Our modern cameras are more than capable of, of getting rid of some of those unneeded pixels. And I guess my point is you don't need to really crowd these birds to, to come away with a nice um, image. This one I printed um, large and it, it came out fine. Uh, next image, please. I would just like to throw out there that I feel that uh, powerful images often evoke some sort of emotion from the viewer. I can't honestly say that I know what birds feel. I think they act a lot on instinct. Their, their instincts are extremely powerful, but you cannot spend time in the outdoors observing parents and their offspring and not sense some sort of connection between them. So when it's possible, I try to include that in my photos. So here you see a least turn a chick. It's not real newly hatched because it is, um, it's dry. And you also see an unhatched egg right in front of the little chick. Now, I think it's critical to once in a while step back and evaluate our captures and say, what is good about this photo and what could I have done better? And in retrospect, I wish that I had raised up just a little bit and shot at a, a slight downward angle. That would have enabled me to get more of that egg, which I think is integral to the image. So while I don't think it's a failed image, I do think it's something that I could have done better. And I challenge you to look at your images in that same way. You know, scour your viewfinder when you're out there in the field so you don't come back to your studio with, you know, with any regrets or saying, oh, gee, I wish I could have done that. A little bit better. Next please. So this is a glamour shot of me. Um, I decided to go to Churchill to um, photograph the shorebirds that gather there in the spring and nest. Um, this it, it, very difficult shooting conditions. Um, it's chilly so you have to have a warm clothes. Top of that you have to throw on waders and these very attractive boots. Um, hat, glove required. And I have never seen mosquitoes like we're up there. So I'm wearing a bug shirt. And when we actually hiked out to get next to that little pond, threw a bug shirt over my head and over my hands. And even so, I ended up back at the car with welts. But these are sort of the things that you kind of have to do if you're passionate about this and you really want to get those photos. Next, please. So this, this image was actually taken the day before the one of me um, in my fancy little suit there. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but sometimes I get into a place and I'm just so excited by what I'm seeing that I tend to be a little bit sloppy with some of my captures. So this is really pretty horrific sort of picture. If you'll notice, there are sensor spots throughout it. There's a mess kind of on the right-hand side, the lower right-hand corner, the lighting is flat. There's no light on the bird's face. But, next slide please, with a little bit of careful editing in Lightroom and Photoshop, look what I was able to, to come away with. Um, I simply cropped out that mess on the right hand side, um, brought it, the picture in a little bit tighter, brought up the exposure, I'm sure by at least a, st a full stop, maybe a little bit more. Um, increase the saturation on the red of that little uh, tundra tree there, that little shrub, uh, lightened the face of the bird a bit, brought out the light in his eye, 
And I feel like this is what you can achieve when you look at photography as an art form, instead of just pushing a button on a camera and walking away with a thousand and one pictures. Um, Photoshop can be sometimes used as a negative. I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, well, that image was Photoshopped. Well, so was film. You know, you didn't look at a little piece of film and see a picture. It needed to be developed and dodged and burned and turned into whatever the artist envisioned. So there's another challenge, you know, to take your, your photography um, on, a, on an artful trip, if you care to. Next, please. So this is my final slide of the afternoon. It is a golden-cheeked warbler. It's the other holy grail bird of Texas, like Laura's um, black-capped vireo. This bird remains on the endangered list. Um, when Ted and I moved to Texas, our one criteria was that we wanted to find interesting land. And this little beat-up parcel that we ended up buying contains a ravine. And in that ravine, there's old-growth cedar and large established very old hardwoods. That's the exact uh, environment that Golden Cheeks need. So I said, hmm, let's give this a try. So we bought the land and sure enough, these birds do indeed um, live and nest here. Now they're very difficult to get uh, photos of them during their nesting. I've actually um, created some pictures of the adults, but nothing that I'm totally in love with yet. Um, one afternoon, not too long ago, I saw this bird in a tree. I was in my kitchen doing dishes and looked out and saw the bird. And I said, hey, time to get out there and see if I can catch some pictures. And sure enough, it landed right on our little water feature and came in for a drink. This was the last day that I saw this bird. I'm guessing that it um, continued on its southward journey. Um, I chose this picture to conclude my part of this talk with because I would like to just make a mention about conservation and my approach to it. Um, kind of take a three-pronged approach. One is on an individual level. I feel it's important for each of us to do whatever we can, make whatever changes we can. You all know what they are. Um, sometimes it's easy to say, well, it's, it's so small it doesn't matter, but many small things add up to big changes, and we owe it to ourselves, our future generations, and our environment to, to make those changes. The second thing that I think is, is critically important is to support organizations that work at what I call like the macro level, such as ABC. Um, they're able to pull resources, people, um, scientific minds far greater than mine and really make some important uh, contributions to preserving habitat and making it better for the birds. And after all, if it's better for the birds, it's better for us as well. And the last thing I just want to mention, we have a big election coming up in November. I strongly urge everybody to get out and vote. I myself am often guilty of not spending enough time researching the positions of the local and the state candidates. Um, they have important uh, roles in the decisions that are made regarding the environment. So I've um, committed to studying and making better, better decisions um, this November. So thank you kindly for your attention this afternoon. You're in for a treat now as I turn you over to Michael and his wonderful photos. Ah, thank you very much, Grace, and hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the ABC, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's very hard in, in a crowd of such amazing photographers to do anything different, so I'm going to try to make a, a few points, and I know we're running up against the clock. Um, the first one is, if you want to get good bird photos, you need to go with bird's eye. Um, and that may well be in your backyard. In, in the case of uh, uh, Grace and Laura, they have some unbelievable birds in the backyard. I'm here in the New York tri-state area. And I also have great birds, but I like to get on airplanes and travel as much as I can um, because you only get one shot at the marble and I want to take really every advantage of it. So the photos I'm going to show are from a trip some time ago to the sub-Antarctic islands of New Zealand. And one of my favorite places that I've ever been was a place called Macquarie Island. You can see me and my wife uh, there surrounded by penguins. So you get an idea of, you know, what kind of photo opportunities you have. But when you are in an environment like this, it's easy to just start clicking away and really kind of forget what you need to do to make um, really special photos. And I want to point out my wife, Ellen, who's unbelievable in terms of tolerating my 
passion, if not uh, pathology, for taking wildlife photos, and the little camera she has, because we're going to show you some shots from it uh, shortly. Next slide. So this is just giving you an idea of, of, of what the environment in a place like this can look like. These are all uh, king penguins. And you see I'm shooting with a very small camera here. But behind me is kind of my core equipment, which is a 600 millimeter F4 with a Canon one series camera. And I have had almost every Canon one series camera that's come out. I think this was the original Canon 1DX. You can see it with a little GPS module on top of it, which I love. It shows me where I am in the world when I take the images. Then I went to the Mark IIs and now, um, and for the last several months, the Mark Threes, which have been unbelievably good cameras. Um, hanging over that is a bandolero strap, and what you can't see is a 300 millimeter F2.8. So I do carry a lot of gear when I do these. Next slide, please. One of my favorite things to do, and on this particular trip, I shot more than 70,000 images. And I have kind of a motto, um, the more images you take, the luckier you get. A lot of it was just because there were so many wonderful flying bird shots to take. Um, and I'm sitting on the back of the boat all day long when we're under sail trying to get shots of these just unbelievably albatross and petrels and other birds coming by. Technically, for a shot like this, it's really very simple in its basic essence. You open your end, lens up wide open, right, because you want to get the fastest shutter speed reasonable. I really dislike noise, so I tend to use lower ISOs, which is why I like these large chip cameras. So with the 1DX, I would go to 800 as kind of my maximum before I started really hating the noise. Now with the 1DX Mark III, I can shoot at ISO 1600. You'll hear some people who, who will go higher on their cameras. It's really personal preference. I also want you to note as we're talking about post-processing, this photo has been very heavily edited. You may or may not note it. This bird was actually right in the center of the frame. And you know, you always want these birds flying into the frame to make the photos more interesting. So everything in front of the bird has been added in Photoshop. It's a very simple fix. Um, I'm sure it could be done better than it is here, and I could work on it more to make it look even more natural. But it's something to keep in mind. And again, um, you know, you, you, no photo is natural. Your eye is not a 600 millimeter lens. So I really take no issue with trying to make the photos be the way I want them to be. Next slide. That same technique, and I think there was a, a chat earlier, how do you get the autofocus? For the pro cameras, at least, you have a whole suite of autofocus points. And you can usually select down to choose one, a very small one, or a circle of them. I tend to use a, a, a center point with surround. And I will move that actively on the, on the back of the camera. You get very natural at doing it with your thumb. My new 1DX Mark III has a little um, thing that makes it very quick and easy to move it around. And I'll put it right where I want the eye to be in the photo. And then the real trick is just keeping that on the eye. This is the same sort of technique of these wonderful royal penguins, you know, coming out of the surf by the hundreds and trying to isolate a bird as it's coming at you at speed and getting that autofocus point sharp. So you need a fast shutter speed here, 32 hundredths of a second, and I'm shooting wide open to get that beautiful background. Next uh, shot. Now, again, it's easy to just stick with your main lens and forget about the beauty around you and how you want to incorporate it. And I consider a shot where the just the as, as Owen showed earlier, where just the background would be an amazing shot, and then you add a bird to it to be really an amazing shot. This is shot with a 24 millimeter 1.4 lens. I just love this lens. Beautiful look, beautiful 3D rendition. It's amazing, and you will notice that I am very close to this bird. Anybody shot with a 24 millimeter lens realize I'm about a foot away, maybe eight inches to get this bird in. And we've talked a lot about the wear fellow of the animals. Well, I got to tell you, this situation was a good thing for both me and the bird. And I'll tell you why. It was a good thing for me because I knew I was going to get some really amazing shots. It was a good thing for the bird because it thought I was going to die when it was going to be able to eat me. Which, uh, you know, for these brown skuas is really, they're just sitting right next to the elephant seal. As far as it was concerned, I was a big elephant seal. I don't think I actually approached him. I think he approached me, which is actually fine. The penguins and these animals will often come up to you curious. And, you know, the bird, when I left, it was sitting right in the same place. Next slide. And then finally, just really to emphasize that we've been looking at all these amazing photos, and I love them with the bird isolated in this beautiful, gorgeous background that is blurred into oblivion. But 
really this for me of, of, of the 70,000 images I took on this trip is absolutely one of my favorites. All of these done within a couple hour period on this island showing this penguin. And if you saw the whole series of shots, it's walking this way, walking that way, almost comical. Then you get this one where it's posed and it's looking to the side. I've got our expedition cruise ship, the Spirit of Enderby in the background. And even though I'm surrounded by tens of thousands of penguins, it's the only one in the shot. And it's absolutely one of my favorite shots from the trip. Um, here's a time where, you know, you'll stop down a little bit to F8. Next slide. And then finally, um, just because we're talking about all this amazing gear, it is not necessary. This is a shot my wife who's sitting next to me didn't mind me showing. And it shot with one of these. The little tiny camera that was hanging around here, this is actually an updated version of the Sony RX10. This one has the equivalent of a 24 to 6 mill 600 millimeter lens on it. That one had the equivalent of a 24 to 200 f2.8 lens, which was amazing, but she doesn't want to be burdened with all this giant equipment. She just wants to, like Owen, take pictures and have good high quality. As a one inch sensor, it's very good. So those of you looking at this and going, well, I can never schlep all that gigantic gear, you don't have to. It limits you in certain things. It's hard to take flying shots with them. I've, I've shot flying shots with it successfully, but it's really a challenge. Anyway, I'm gonna have to finish here. I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Shoaib Tureen, uh, another amazing photographer. Thank you. Joy, you're you're muted still. All right, sorry, I'm going to start again. Um, my name is Shweb Tareen. I currently live in Cannon Beach on the Oregon coast. Um, first, I want to thank ABC for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And I'm honored to share the stage with some of the most amazing photographers in the country. As far back as I, I can remember, I always was fascinated by birds. And I formally started birding in the 80s. My story is the journey I made from being a hardcore birder to a photographer. Um, I've traveled all over the world to find birds. And then sometime in about 2006, I started to think about recording what I was seeing. And so I picked up a camera and uh, started taking pictures. Um, it was also uh, a way to, to keep the record and to be able to share some of the birds that I'd seen. But I quickly realized that bird photography was a lot more difficult than listing birds. In birding, you run and gun. You, as soon as you take one, you move to the next one. Your uh, whole goal is to maximize the number of birds you can see, and your speed is your biggest tool. Uh, whereas in bird photography, um, you need to slow down. You need to give your subject wide space. Be patient. You can't make sudden moves and scare the bird. You have to wait for the right moment to capture the image. And not only I had to develop new photography skills, I had to learn to connect with the birds at a completely different level. I started to see birds as individuals. I learned that two birds of the same species can be quite different. One may, be, one may have a very calm demeanor, while another bird of the same species would be real skittish and you have to let it go. I start paying attention to their feeding behavior, mating behavior, nesting, and caring for young and so forth. And now, every time I go out with my camera to take bird photos, I look forward to learning something new about 
these amazing and probably the most charismatic creatures on the planet. Uh, first slide, please. Can you uh, put the slide on? Thank you. This is a bar-tailed godwit that um, is, a, is a large shorebird. It winters in New Zealand and every spring flies nonstop from New Zealand, a 6,000 mile journey to the northwestern coast of Alaska. It's a wary and skittish bird, often hard to approach. This bird was photographed along Dalton Highway near Dead Horse. The highway is a 600 mile gravel road which starts in Fairbanks, goes through the spectacular Brooks Range and through the vast Arctic tundra ending in Dead Horse near the Arctic Sea. We found a couple of these birds around midday on the last day of our trip. In the Arctic heat, sometimes the heat from the sun creates a mirage-like phenomena, which makes very difficult to focus on, on the bird on the ground. So I finally ditched the tripod, um, changed the setting to flight shooting, and was able to get this shot. Next slide, please. King Eider, Barrow, Alaska. The best time to photograph birds in the high Arctic is between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. The sun stays on the horizon. The light is warmer and softer, similar to the kind you see during the magic, the golden hour. More importantly, the birds are calm, resting, and they're easy to approach. This eider was on a partially melted ice pond. And at times, water birds are more approachable from water because most threats come from land. The only way to get a decent shot was to get in the pond. So I put on my chest waders and climbed in. The bottom of the pond was still icy. Um, I had to um, navigate around some large blocks of ice. The image of falling with my gear in the pond crossed my mind several times, but it worked and I was able to get this shot. Next slide, please. We were crossing the tundra in Churchill when we fleshed this wimbrel from its nest. It was really well camouflaged. Because tundra is always cold, it's critical that the eggs are not exposed for long. We immediately turn around and walk away from the area to allow the bird to get back. We waited at a distance. The bird quickly came back and resumed incubating the eggs. While we waited, I added 1.4 teleconverter to my 600 millimeter lens to increase the reach to about 850 millimeter. I then slowly crawled on my stomach to get within a reasonable range, slowly raised the camera and captured this image. I especially like this because it frames the bird with Arctic azaleas, lichens, and grasses. Next image, please. My buddy and I, Dan, uh, my buddy Dan and I were um, wrapping up a night shot, a photo shoot. And as we were leaving, I noticed two small gulls at a distance on a snowbank. I told Dan that we need to check these birds out. He agreed, but he was less than enthusiastic. Once we got close enough to ID the birds, I asked Dan if he was ready to see a unicorn. Ross's gull is one of the rarest and most difficult gulls to see in North America. I was very lucky to find and photograph these two birds in breeding plumage. Next photo, please. Blue throat is one of the three Eurasian birds, along with the Arctic warbler and northern whittier, that nest in northwest Alaska. It's a member of the old world flycatcher called Chats. It winters in North Africa and in India and Pakistan. Nome is probably the most reliable place to see this bird. 
this particular bird was singing on a willow shrub. And at one point, it turned its head just right, and the sun lit up the iridescent blue throat. To get the best light on your subject, try to position yourself so that the sun is behind your back. And with that, I conclude your, my presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am going to be starting the Q&A right now. Unfortunately, we don't have very much time since we're over, um, but we will take just a few quick questions. And a uh, friendly reminder, we are recording this webinar and we will be sending out a follow-up email that has links to uh, references, the webinar recording, and more. So I'm going to start and I'm going to ask Grace, if you're willing, uh, to talk a little bit more about how close you can get to birds and um, how to respect their space while still getting those incredible shots. Sure, I'm happy to offer you a few thoughts. Um, I will mention that every situation and every bird are different. Um, you'll approach some birds who just absolutely don't care that you're around, and there's others that look, you look at them and they, they just want nothing to do with you. So that's the first thing I would mention. Um, the second thing is, I personally would always elect to err on the side of caution and stay back a little bit further than maybe even is necessary. Um, these birds don't have it easy. They nest in a very short amount of time. They have to lay their eggs and get their offspring out. Um, if it's a raptor, he might be looking for his, his meal of the day. Um, so my own ethics dictate that I stay back. Um, let the bird kind of decide what he or she wants to do. Like I mentioned in, in the um, other part of the talk, I don't mind shooting with a long lens teleconverter and cropping significantly if I have to. Wonderful, thank you, Grace. Sure. Uh, the next question I'm gonna ask Laura, cause you talked about backyard birds. And so we've had some questions. I'm gonna try and summarize them right now. Uh, how do you stay excited about common birds? such as ones in your backyard? And then also how do you help create uh, both those like picturesque backgrounds that were discussed as well as set up for backyard bird photography? Well, I think any bird that you have in your backyard is exciting, even if it's a house sparrow, because it gives you a feeling of nurturing. It, it, it's, I mean, there's nothing to be lost in feeding birds and providing water for them. And um, I think I've made an effort here to provide water, especially for the birds, because we are often in drought and it's uh, really vital to them. And, you know, it brings birds into me, so I get to see more birds. And um, I, I, you know, I, I just built this little fountain. It was a, like a two foot square uh, reservoir and it has a recirculating pump. And I put rocks around it to make it look natural. And um, then, I find sticks and branches to uh, prop up behind it to provide a perch for them to land on. And the angle that I sit on my porch, it's pretty far away. So it gives a really nice background, a real blurred background with my camera. So, um, and you can use, you know, pretty much any type of, uh, any type of perch, any type of branch, and you can clip a branch to, you know, a, a, your either your tripod or, you know, go, you can, do almost anything that you think looks pretty. If you find a branch that's even flowering, you could um, you could break a branch off of your tree and uh, clip it with a clamp to a tripod and put it next to the water and, you know, birds will land on that. And I, I did that at my house in Ohio. I, I actually, I love redbud trees and I planted a redbud tree. So every spring I would sacrifice a branch from my redbud tree and take the branch, a pretty branch, and clamp it above my feeder. And it was always exciting for that day. I would choose the best day with the best weather. And it was always exciting to see which birds would land on my branch. And I could get pictures of, um, you know, goldfinch and um, the white-breasted nuthatch and uh, gnat catchers. Even gnat catchers came in just because they were curious as to what the other birds were up to. They don't 
feed at the feeder, but um, yeah, I mean, there's just so many different, um, you know, just use your imagination and just kind of look at it with a critical eye. Like, you know, what would, what would, what would first of all land on this and then take a picture of the branch and see what the background looks like. And it, it might need to be a little bit higher so that it doesn't blend into the ground. So it's just a matter of just experimenting. Thanks, Laura. Uh, with, with so many folks unfortunately needing to leave right now, I'm gonna ask for the next slide, please. Um, I just wanna remind folks that again, this webinar is being recorded and we will follow up. You can also find more information um, about ABC as an organization and the conservation projects that we're doing on abcbirds.org as well as our social media. And we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, just in the, the interest of trying to cover a lot of the patterns of questions following, Michael, I'm gonna ask you a question uh, because a lot of folks were, were amazed at your 70,000 photos that you referenced. And so um, in the interest of a lot of investment in gear and the money that is expected with camera equipment, how would you uh, describe the, the time commitment, both in terms of taking photos as well as the processing and helping folks uh, understand how to adjust for all of that as they get into photography? You're on mute still, Michael. Yeah, I know. I couldn't unmute myself. Thanks, Jordan. Oh. Um, yeah, I shoot a lot of photos. Again, you know, depending on the situation, I'm, I, I've been doing this long enough that I'm not going to sit there blasting away at a robin that hasn't moved. But when I'm somewhere like, you know, the island I showed you, I know that the difference between, you know, a shot where the bird's doing, you know, in this position and this position can actually be great. So I'm shooting with a 12, now I think 16 frame per second motor drive. And I'm counting on that to do a couple of things. One, get that special moment that you might have missed otherwise. And the faster the drive gets, the faster shutter speed I've been able to use, the more just unbelievable shots I've gotten that I literally would rarely see before these innovations. Um, the other one is for sharpness. You've seen a lot of photos where they're shooting at a very low shutter speed and the bird's moving. So it'll be very common if you're shooting just a warbler that's bouncing around, that bird's moving. And if you shot, you know, in a second, 16 images of it, one of them may be sharpened. All of the other ones may not be quite as sharp and I throw them away. So then the process is <clears throat> I dump all of them onto my computer. I load them all into Lightroom. I render them all at 100%. And then I'm just going delete, 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 looking at them at 100% or higher magnification for sharpness. So I can go through photos very, very quickly. You do a couple of calls to get down to your core set of them. Then the real work starts, which is actually putting in metadata for the photo so I know what everything is, what the behavior is, what the plumage type is, et cetera. And then you will process those, process those into your final image because I'm shooting everything in RAW, which as you've seen some of the processing, if you have a perfectly exposed shot and perfect light and everything was fine, it just takes a, a, a click. But if you have one that needs a little more work to make it special, it takes a lot longer. So I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Michael. I'm gonna take one more question. Uh, and this is actually from Facebook. We've been uh, live streaming on Facebook. And this question is for Owen. Uh, Owen, uh, people have also been amazed coming uh, of your background, coming from fashion photography to nature photography. Do you have any tips on how you made that transition and, and learning nature photography since it's so different uh, from, your, from your original background? Well, first of all, as you saw some of the years, I put there very gradually. Uh, number one, and it's passion. What turns you on? What gets you excited? What makes you happy? I think um, Laura was talking about the birds in her uh, garden or backyard. I have some, I really get excited. I can sit for hours and hours. Uh, and sometimes I'll sit in my hide and just watch the birds and I compose my pictures. I shoot a lot of pictures. The background won't be good. Sometimes I improve the background in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom, but you've got to start with a pretty good picture. It's, um, I love doing fashion photography um, and uh, I love the birds. They're so pretty. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it was, it's, it's fun. It, what turns me on? 
Mike, do you have any other tips for beginning photographers, whether it's for bird photography, if there are classes or books or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of classes online that you can take. Um, my Facebook is bombarded with a variety of different classes. And I've obviously self-identified as a bird photographer there. I know there's lots of different classes. I'd recommend those. But finding a friend who knows a little bit more than you is always great. That's what I've always learned and gone out with people who are bird photographers and just like learning, you know, different basic tips about how to use your camera, those types of things. I think that there's always the question about what kind of camera should I get? You can do a certain amount with a point and shoot, but when you get a DSLR, um, that's when things really open up because you get selectable autofocus points and selectable autofocus points are the difference that most people are missing with points and shoots because then you can get many more picks in focus get flight shots, things like that. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of comments about teleconverters as well. And there's a, there's a sort of instinct to, to start with, well, the more, the more zoom you can get, the better. But don't forget that teleconverters actually take down your aperture. And so you lose light. And unless you have a lot of light, you often get blurry pictures with teleconverters. If you've got a brilliant sunny day and the sun's right behind you and the bird's sitting still and you've got a tripod, great. But normally um, they're, they're challenging. I would say just try and get a DSLR, um, learn how to use the autofocus points, use AV mode, which is what I use. Um, you're gonna get the most light and then do what the other folks have said, get out there and practice uh, and focus on your background. And I think you'll start to see your pictures are starting to get better that way. Um, if you're already there, um, you've probably gone past where I'm at already and I'll hope to learn something from you when I, I find you out in the field. Wonderful. Um, again, apologies to everyone who had wonderful questions that we couldn't get to. We will be sure to share all of the links and uh, the recording of this webinar. I'm just going to turn it over to, to Mike Parr for any closing words. And thank you again yeah. to all of our panelists. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Jordan for, for helping with moderating the panel. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. If you email us, we will try and pick up as many as we can. I saw a lot of questions we didn't have time to get to that I'd love to be able to try and help answer those questions because there's definitely things we can do, do to uh, all improve our photography. Um, if you uh, are interested in helping ABC, we'd love to invite you to join abcbirds.org. We will be sending around the prior webinar, which had a lot more technical information about sort of how to get started and gear like that. So I'd recommend that. And we probably will be doing some more of these webinars. So watch out for the spot, uh, spots in your email or on Facebook. And I just want to thank everybody who joined the panel today. Um, you're just great friends and great photographers. And I really appreciate your sharing your knowledge with me and with everybody who joined today. Um, bird photography is tremendously good fun. And I just want to tell people who are getting started or, or who are seeing these pictures, you can do this. I was like uh, nowhere seven years ago and I got a DSLR and I've learned from my friends and I've gotten much, much better through that and everybody who's taking bird photographs can get there too. If I can do it, you can uh, for sure. Cause I was a terrible photographer um, not too long ago and it's just great fun. So enjoy it, learn from others, um, participate in the community of bird photography online. And I think you're gonna really have fun with it and help birds along the way through ABC. And just wanna say thank you for joining. Thanks very much everybody. See you next time.